Okay, so um, welcome to the session. To, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to build uh, multi-protocol IoT nodes uh, with a specific focus to those three protocols over there, so uh, Thread, BLE, and Zigbee. Um, and here's uh, the summary of the session. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, the, the advantages of the benefits of developing such IoT systems uh, with a focus to new platforms that make it feasible to implement such multi-protocol multi system also at the edge node of IoT, so not, not only in a gateway. Uh, we'll summarize a little bit uh, the main use cases for the different protocol standards, focusing on those three, look at some use cases, then go a, a little bit deeper into the um, uh, an, uh, anatomy of such systems. So look at the, the platforms, the stacks that are uh, being used there, some considerations for applications if you're building a, a multi-protocol device. And finally, we'll do um, uh, some examples at the end where we'll actually uh, uh, work with, with actual development hardware and, and firmware and software and to see how uh, such a system uh, behaves. Okay, uh, first a little bit about myself. My name is uh, Alain Lazar. I'm a software engineering manager with NXP Semiconductors. Um, I've been working with uh, low power wireless protocols for about uh, 10 years now. Um, I've been involved uh, during this time in, in shipping uh, stacks, tools, um, application software that deals with um, uh, Zigbee, Thread, and BLE stacks, uh, focusing uh, a lot also on, on the standardization and um, uh, the, the certification aspect uh, with respect to interoperability, so multi-vendor interoperability uh, with respect to these standards. And right now, I'm also serving as a vice chair of the Thread Group Technical Committee. Okay. So let's get into it. So uh, let's, let's first um, understand why it's it would good to have a system that implements uh, multiple protocols. So there are about three main reasons for doing that. Uh, and again, we're talking uh, and focusing on the edge node here, so not necessarily on the gateway. So first of all, uh, it, it greatly expands the, the connectivity uh, so basically the number of devices and the number of networks that uh, an IoT device can actually connect to. So if, if, if you implement, for instance, one of the, the standard, let's say BLE, you can connect to uh, smart for other BLE devices, but also if you implement one of the other standards, then it's possible to connect to, to mesh networks and other uh, such devices. So it greatly expands uh, and makes it very flexible to uh, add multiple, um, uh, multiple connectivity, multiple direct connectivity ways of, of um, uh, an IoT edge node device. And with that comes a, a reduction in design costs. So uh, just think about uh, the fact that uh, if you're building an IoT device and uh, maybe it's a, it's a BLE and then, it's, uh, uh, then you implement another standard, uh, you don't need to do two different SKUs. So you just do one SKU with, with a, a potentially a single firmware build. Uh, so that simplifies life a little bit that, uh, for instance, when you go have to do um, RF or FCC certification or uh, other certification, you go with, with a single variant of the hardware. Uh, and um, uh, this, uh, this can greatly uh, make a, such a design uh, advantageous from a cost perspective. And finally, uh, with such systems uh, that, that implement multi multiple protocols, uh, usually you get some processing associated with them, also some security features. So th what that gets you is actually uh, for, for the application, it, it blurs uh, the uh, radio interface. So it doesn't matter too much whether you're doing BLE or Zigbee or Thread or uh, some of the other or the other protocols at the application level is just a firmware decision uh, which of the those interfaces you use. So um, basically it's choosing the best of all worlds. So a lot of these protocol standards have some some strengths uh, and some weaknesses. So it's basically ex exploiting a lot of the, the, the current strengths with such a multi-protocol system. So uh, also uh, future-proofing your, your design and uh, reducing a lock-in in a, in a certain vertical, let's say, as, as it's um, being, uh, being deployed now. So let's look at uh, these pro three protocol standards that are the focus of uh, our session. Uh, so Bluetooth, uh, how, how many of you have, have worked with Bluetooth Flow Energy or did Bluetooth Flow Energy designs? Okay. 
quite a few. Uh, how about Zigbee? Okay. And Thread? Okay. Got one for Thread. Okay, so um, let's go uh, a little bit through their main points uh, uh, and, uh, again, strengths and weaknesses. So, um, Bluetooth first, so we're talking here mainly about Bluetooth uh, LE used in, uh, in IoT devices. Uh, usually use that to connect uh, your, your accessory or your uh, wearable device to a smartphone or a PC or a tablet. Um, it, it's very good for devices that don't have user interfaces to go to your uh, mobile app and use that as the user interface for the IoT device. It's mainly direct connections uh, from, from your smart device to that accessory. Also, well, we've seen a lot of usage uh, of BLE in, in beacons. Um, Zigbee, uh, Zigbee has been with us for quite a number of years. I think the, the initial uh, development of the protocol started uh, early, early 2001. 2002. So it's quite a mature mesh protocol focused on home automation and lighting uh, deployments. Uh, so right now I think there's a few hundreds of uh, Zigbee devices which are certified in those areas. So mainly home automation, lighting. Uh, Zigbee also had some, um, uh, some attempts to go also into the smart grid market. So we've got a smart energy uh, profile that works. But mostly the focus and especially the newest uh, version of the standard that's uh, uh, dubbed Zigbee 3.0, uh, a lot of that uh, is focused uh, on, on home automation and lighting. A lot of the, the current uh, smart home hubs, which you can, uh, which, which you can buy in retail, uh, come with a Zigbee radio, and uh, those certified devices can interact with that Zigbee radio. Uh, what about Thread? Uh, Thread uh, is, is a, a newer protocol. It's being defined by the Thread group. Um, it's reusing the, the Mac file, so the uh, layer one, layer two, uh, IEEE 8215 .4 that uh, Zigbee is also using, but what it does, it defines a full IPv6 network stack on top of that. And that IPv6 network stack is built uh, in the thread standard uh, to also scale at uh, the same category of devices that Bluetooth and Zigbee cover, so these very small IoT devices like a coin cell. Uh, battery device. Also, uh, Thread improves a little bit the mesh concept from the other protocols in that it's um, uh, no single point of failure mesh network. So uh, if the, uh, your gateway or one of the, the, the main routers in the network um, uh, that, that coordinates the routing and maintains the network uh, as a whole um, uh, is, is decommissioned or uh, is turned off, then other uh, routers can take over for some of those more centralized functions in, in the other protocol. So that makes Thread Network overall and Thread Mesh Networks a little bit more resilient. Um, also, uh, being IPv6, uh, Thread um, uh, goes and defines uh, border router architecture. So border router are, are gateway type devices at the edge, so it could be a networking device, but could also be appliance device. And those devices are multi-protocol in that they, uh, they implement uh, also uh, an interface like uh, Wi-Fi or Ethernet uh, and uh, the thread IEEE 8.15.4 radio. And uh, then you can actually uh, send IP packets from the edge node, IPv6 uh, edge node, up to uh, maybe a, a mobile device in the, in the LAN through Wi-Fi or uh, further on to the cloud. So all these uh, three protocol standards are, are open standards, so they're being developed by um, industry uh, standard groups uh, like the, the Bluetooth SIG, the Zigbee Alliance, and the Thread Group. So um, all of them are, are similar from this perspective in, in that you need to be a member in order to um, be able to influence the specification and get access to the um, interoperability and certification uh, program. So these um, alliances basically offer a set of tools and also a, a, a full certification program in order to, to ensure that your devices work uh, together seamlessly, yeah. Why don't you have Z-Wave or Sigfox as well? Uh, sure, so uh, we're focusing on these three as part of, of this talk. Um, I, I have some points at the end that touch a little bit on those uh, items that you mentioned. So Zigfox and LoRa are basically uh, uh, wide area, low power networks. So um, they're implemented in some uh, ways with different platforms that these the platforms that implement these three protocols. Uh, so, uh, and, and then Z-Wave is similar in that 
due to the fact that it's using another uh, frequency band, it's a, a little bit difficult to build very integrated systems that also add Z-Wave. Right? So it's mainly uh, all these three uh, um, protocols that I'm listing here are in the 2.4. Uh, gigahertz band, so they, uh, they operate uh, globally. So again, you, you just need to do one uh, hardware design and that works globally as part of the, uh, uh, the 2.4 band. So uh, that, that's again, one of the advantage here. But that doesn't preclude using those, uh, those centers, just we're focusing on these three in, in this talk because we're going to see a, a little bit on how the, the integration goes and uh, you actually have all these three protocols in a single chip. Okay, so let's, let's look at a use case um, for how you'd, uh, uh, you'd get the benefit of, of uh, having two or three of these uh, standards in your uh, single device. So let's imagine you have uh, your, your mesh network here, a home automation network, or maybe a, a different type of network. So you've got these uh, router devices, the, the, uh, the orange, hexagons over there, the end nodes, uh, they all form a, a mesh network and communicate as part of the mesh. Uh, and let's say you've got a home automation network and you've got a connected uh, uh, smart lock. Uh, so that mesh uh, today may be implemented with, uh, with Zigbee or Thread. Uh, but if you also implement uh, Bluetooth in that uh, smart lock device, then uh, you can uh, go and uh, meet such use cases where uh, the, the user interacts via their smartphone or their smartwatch or their wearable directly via BLE to that node. So outside the band of the, the main mesh network, but at the same time, the device continues to operate and be controlled in the mesh. So let's, let's say that uh, the, the smart lock implements thread then uh, it also has an IPv6 address that it can be used to, to communicate with a, with a uh, cloud device management service. Uh, at the same time, uh, with, with uh, its BLE operation, which allows a more seamless uh, operation by users for uh, when they actually need to talk to, to, to that smart lock or need to interact with that device. So basically, it, um, the, the multi-protocol implementation uh, facilitates these, these kind of new interaction scenarios where multiple standards are combined and uh, some of their strengths are, are exploited. Okay. Okay, so let's see how one would, would go and, and build such a device. So what do you need first? Uh, so right now we, we see a, a, an emergence of integrated microcontrollers that have multi-mode ra multi radios, and those really stand at the base of the um, uh, multi-protocol systems that implement uh, such standards as we, as we saw earlier. Um, and actually, uh, there, there have been quite a, uh, a bit of those released uh, lately. So NXP has one of them. The, the schematic is pictured here, but a lot of our competitors also have very similar devices. So uh, what, what's common uh, uh, among these devices is that they, they usually implement um, an ARM Cortex-M um, as, as a main processing unit, and that's uh, usually implemented in the same uh, silicon package as a system on a chip with a multi-mode radio. So usually the multi-mode radio in, in most cases uh, is uh, uh, BLE4 uh, plus capable and 50, uh, IEEE 802.15.4 capable, uh, which means that it can uh, implement those three uh, uh, standards that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons. There are some similarities because these all operate in 2.4, so it's pretty easy to, to actually these days build this uh, multi-mode radio and integrate it with, uh, with a processing core. Um, these devices usually differentiate through their memory capacity at pretty standard uh, memory uh, for, for the microcontroller core, for instance, the 512K of flash, 128K of RAM. Uh, so we see uh, uh, maybe on the RAM side, uh, an increase uh, versus what people were usually using up until a, uh, a year or so ago, just because um, for some of these multi-protocol use cases, the RAM is very helpful to do things like packet buffering and uh, be able to run uh, several, two or, or several of the stacks uh, uh, concurrently, which need uh, uh, both the flash and RAM for, for storing state and, and tables and um, uh, also allow some space for the, for the application. 
uh, and usually also have a, a set of security blocks integrated, so you'll have uh, uh, some commonalities also uh, with that because uh, a lot of these standards reuse AES-128 and uh, random number generator. You'll, because of the radio, you can actually implement true random number generators. Okay, so that's the, the first step, uh, having such a platform. And then going to, to the firmware. Um, uh, you, you'll need a multi-protocol stack, right? So you've got pictured here um, the high-level architecture of how such a stack would, would look like. Uh, so uh, got, uh, at the bottom, we've got a multi-mode uh, transceiver, as we mentioned. And uh, because uh, the, the uh, ZigBee and Thread reuse the IEEE 802.15.4 Mac5, you only need one implementation of that. Uh, that runs uh, in parallel or is uh, the same uh, layer in the protocol, maybe with a BLE controller. And then going further up in the, in the stack layers, we've got a BLE host, uh, uh, GAP, GATT profiles on the BLE side, so this is pretty much its own vertical. Uh, these days, and then uh, similar for Zigbee, uh, for Zigbee 3 and, and previous versions, uh, you'll have a Zigbee Pro mesh layer uh, that does some of the, the base networking, and then got a Zigbee cluster library framework uh, that does uh, the, um, some of the application semantics around the uh, around application functionality. And then uh, Thread is an IPv6 stack that's um, uh, made for constrained devices, so it reuses six low pan as defined by ITF and then it adds uh, IPv6-based routing uh, for the mesh side, but then on top of that, you've got a pretty standard uh, IPv6 and UDP socket layer, so the application can interact uh, pretty seamlessly in the usual IP way with that. What's regularly built on top of that, though, is uh, other application layer um, frameworks that are made for constrained devices, such as those based on, on co-op. Uh, so we've got these, uh, these uh, blocks at the stack layer, and then uh, 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 the, uh, the application layer, we can have the single uh, chip device application that can uh, actually uh, take advantage of all the, the, the flexibility that the, the, the stack layer offers. So for instance, if the application uh, for that IoT device demands that uh, you, you'll get some UI displayed by a user for a, uh, for a short time, then it will enable the BLE stack. So it will enable that and the user will get a user interface on, on its smartphone. If it needs to be uh, active in a mesh and, and communicate to, to smart plugs or lights that it, it might uh, uh, enable the, the Zigbee interface. We've got IP scenarios where it communicates to a, uh, to a cloud or other thread devices then that we uh, uh, implement the thread. And, you can actually mix and match, so all these are, are usually implemented as, as pretty modular blocks, uh, and uh, as we'll see a bit later, uh, can also be uh, coordinated in, in order to, to, to run concurrently. Okay. Okay, a few considerations on, on such uh, uh, multi-mode application, multi-protocol application. So we'll have a a set of, of uh, items that are relevant in this case. So uh, first on the firmware system. So the firmware system perhaps, as we saw in the stack picture, has a bit more complexity uh, just because you need to, to manage all these items. However, you usually only need to, to build a single piece of firmware, uh, even uh, uh, though your device, uh, a, a single piece of firmware for, for these multiple protocols, instead of doing uh, maybe a, a multi-chip scenario where you need to have different firmware for each of the, the chips that are in the system. Uh, an RTOS usually helps here uh, because what, what you uh, could do is run some of the, um, especially the lower layers, of, such as the BLE controller, such as the MACFI, also the upper layers in, in different RTOS stacks and exploit the advantages that, are, that an RTOS uh, brings uh, with this. But, uh, a bare metal system is also, is also an option. Uh, then uh, what you also have in terms of firmware is some sort of management module that allows the uh, concurrency management. So if you do want to use multiple of those protocols uh, uh, at the same time at, uh, at runtime, basically, so choose dynamically between those, then you need to, to manage the, the, their concurrency uh, or their coexistence. 
then, uh, depending on the, the category of the device, so that uh, whether it's a battery-powered sleepy device or maybe it's a mains power that's, that's a, a kind of a, a smart plug or another a light bulb, let's say, uh, that doesn't have uh, that much uh, constraints on the power side, so uh, what you can do is uh, actually that, that could implement one of the, the router functions in the, in the protocols that allow it. However, um, the, the messaging pattern of the device, of how often do they transmit, whether they, uh, there are sleepy devices which pull their parent, whether there are sleepy BLE devices which, uh, for instance, in some cases uh, establish connections and then um, uh, detach from that connection. Uh, and all these communication patterns need to be uh, considered in order to uh, take advantage of the concurrency uh, management APIs and, uh, and the application are kind of coordinate between these. Um, OTA updates, uh, it's um, probably uh, uh, in such a system you'd have a common way of, of uh, the platform level of updating the firmware. Uh, so probably have a, a common uh, bootloader uh, that, that supports uh, updating the firmware, probably uh, 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 modules or items that allow you to verify uh, that firmware image and, and do the, the, the firmware update itself. But on the actual uh, protocol and interface that's, that's being used in order to do the firmware updates, perhaps not all of those uh, two or three would be used. I would use maybe uh, the ones that have uh, the better throughput or uh, are, are more handy in terms of accessing the OTA server. So if you uh, go and update uh, such a multi-protocol -pro -pro device, you could uh, actually connect it through, the, through BLE uh, and uh, use your, your app to uh, update it with a, with a new firmware. But even if that device also communicates on another protocol, another stack in another uh, network uh, for, for the, the Zigbee or the thread. So. Uh, without necessarily having to do OTA over those uh, network interfaces. Uh, so that's the OTA updates. Uh, the application protocol and the ecosystem also plays a role. So uh, most likely for, for uh, protocols that will uh, be IP based. So there are quite a, a few number of options there. For instance, you could use uh, lightweight M2M or uh, OCF uh, constrained uh, IoTivity or, or other uh, application layers that, uh, that use IP. So that's another design consideration. With uh, uh, BLE and, and Zigbee, you kind of need to, to choose the respective profiles and see if there's, uh, those would be standard profiles or uh, there are some, uh, some manufacturer extensions that are needed for those. Uh, and last but not least, of course, security. So from a security perspective, definitely such a multi protocol system um, creates new uh, or expands the, the, the attack surface because right now you could actually access that device from multiple interfaces. So care and consideration needs to be uh, given to, to, to that aspect. Again, a lot of the, the common platform and software security blocks may be reusable across those multiple protocols. So, uh, you'd use similar, uh, similar AES uh, modules, for instance, between all three, because all, all, all use that. Um, but then uh, from a, a perspective of key provisioning, let's say, you'd probably have different uh, key materials uh, across those three. So that needs to be um, taken in consideration and, and considered uh, when building such a system. Okay. So I'll... I'll Go a little bit uh, further to the um, um, concurrent radio protocol. So this is an example of how an API that lets one uh, application manage between all these uh, multiple uh, stacks or multiple uh, modes of the radio uh, would be implemented. So it's, it's uh, basically a variation of your uh, concurrent API. Uh, this one in particular is, is also based on the, the mobile wireless standard that uh, uh, also says a few things about how you do protocol coexistence. Uh, and it's got your uh, regular like acquire release um, APIs or uh, it, it allows one of the protocols to, to send an idle signal callback when uh, the, the radio is no longer used by that respective protocol stack or uh, the operation has ceased. Uh, you also could get something like a, an, um, 
uh, inactivity duration. So this basically allows to uh, one of the protocols to coordinate with the others and, and the system that's uh, being managed by this API. And um, you can actually get information on when the next uh, operation of the radio uh, will be done by, by another protocol. So you can actually, uh, knowing that time frame, you can actually uh, use that at, at, its, uh, at its best and know, for instance, if you've got different priorities between these uh, stacks or radio modes, uh, then know when you might be preempted by, uh, by a higher priority mode. Yeah. Uh, sure. So, so all, all three are, are basically optimized uh, in some capacity for very uh, um, deep sleep power states. So nodes, for instance, that um, uh, put the MC on the radio in in deep sleep mode for extended periods, starting with a, with a few seconds, but expanding until uh, minutes, hours, maybe. Um, and um, once once the node wake up, then either it uh, it uses BLE to to sync up with a, with a quick connection, or if it's using the uh, uh, IEEE 8215.4 connection, then it will uh, probably have that sleepy node will probably have a parent device. So uh, once it wakes up, it can synchronize through through a 15.4 data request to pull that parent for data. Uh, but yeah, a, a lot of these uh, protocols allow for that and are designed for that. And in a multi-protocol system, uh, that makes things a little bit easier because if you don't need to, to do this multiplexing of the radio being always on for some of the protocols, uh, being on for the, for that uh, small amount of time when the device is uh, in uh, uh, is out of sleep and that's usually a few milliseconds uh, at each wake up, then it's much easier to manage because it doesn't have any any uh, tight timing uh, characters. You can just wake up and then serialize multiple operation uh, in terms of uh, if you're running all these protocols. Like, um, sleep and then trigger wake up. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, you'll, you'll probably have, so one, the node is in deep sleep, it, it's probably doing that based on a low power timer. So when it, it went to sleep, uh, it set a certain timer. So the node has the control of how much it's, it's in that deep sleep power state. So it's not kind of a wake on radio type of, uh, of, of operation. Okay. Okay, so... Um, uh, an expansion of the of the coexistence API, for instance, there uh, there's an example here of, of additional API. If you don't do a single chip operation, so you don't have those synchronization uh, primitives, then you um, might do the uh, a, a pin-based coexistence. So if you have uh, multiple chips that uh, you use to implement a multi-protocol system. Uh, you could uh, use some of the GPIO pins to actually synchronize the radios at the, at the low, uh, low layer um, uh, in terms of when they transmit. Again, all these are using the same uh, RF uh, space, the same RF band, so it's, it's uh, very useful to coordinate. If the application has control on uh, all the, uh, the radio operation, it's useful to coordinate uh, using this coexistence mechanism. And basically, can do various things like uh, setting uh, setting the priorities of, of these operation. Uh, some higher priorities mo uh, uh, modes can preempt lower uh, priority modes and uh, get idle indication, get acquire release for uh, the um, uh, radio operation uh, with such APIs. Okay. Um, so we, we saw what happens at the edge. What about the gateways? Of course, gateways uh, are, are still in the equation these days. So for some of the devices that um, uh, don't have a direct connection to, uh, to your uh, smartphone or uh, to, uh, to a uh, LAN interface that you probably use uh, such a, a gateway or hub, and that's also a multi-protocol system. Um, so we've got one pictured here. Uh, what's happening for these, uh, and again, with, with this 
uh, standard, especially going with thread, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, all supporting uh, IP, is that we see a transition from uh, application layer gateways, as, we, as they are very common these days, especially implemented in things like smart home hubs, to more like network layer gateways. So probably see a lot of these IoT standard protocols be deployed more into um, uh, into things that are part of the network infrastructure, right? like uh, access point, customer premise equipment from uh, from your ISP and things like that. Uh, but of course, in the uh, in the gateway uh, on the gateway side, uh, you've got a, a much more complex configuration. So we usually use uh, embedded Linux for that. That's one of our, uh, our reference design pictured here. I won't go into all the, the details of the, of the schematic, just wanted to point out some of the differences maybe to a device that's multi protocol at the edge. So uh, you don't have s uh, the same co cost constraints. You, you can do a lot more complex uh, operation through the, through the Linux system. So in, in many cases for a gateway, it actually makes sense to, uh, to put multiple radio interfaces, even if they're similar, even if it's the same radio, if you want to do multi-protocol. Just because these gateways uh, also have some um, um, uh, requirements that they need to, to be close to 100% on for the network interface. So uh, doing things like the, the concurrency operation that uh, sometimes switches between the, the different stacks uh, is, uh, um, is probably not a, a good thing to do on a gateway. Uh, another thing is, is that the way the such gateways are implemented, uh, you probably have the, the, the Bluetooth size of BLE and maybe uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the full Bluetooth uh, combined with a Wi-Fi device rather than, than we saw with, uh, with some of the IoT radio in a multi-mode device. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah, kind of the two point four gigahertz mm -hmm. space, and you're operating uh, separate radio modules concurrently. Um, are there, are there more issues in operating discrete modules over? Is the sort of monolithic solution better in that case, or is that not? not well, we've got the two concurrency aspects, right? The first is the uh, the concurrent operation in terms of the processing, so in terms of how the the stacks get access to the to the core in order to run. And you've got maybe in, in the case of BLE, uh, you've got very um, tight timing constraints. So you need to do like microsecond operation. So the the uh, from a processing perspective, you uh, there there are some uh, uh, actual uh, tight requirements to that from processing uh, uh, perspective. Then you've got the the RF operation. I said the, the RF operation, definitely if you uh, have multiple cores that run your radios, uh, it would be good to synchronize if you're using the same band. If you're not using the same band, that uh, it's, it's fine to, to not synchronize. So it's, it's those two concurrency aspects. First, if you've got this monolithic single chip, specifically edge node uh, type device, you can run into both scenarios. If you kind of get this, uh, this system you usually have a lot of the heavy weight of the, the tight timing constraint be done by the, the auxiliary module, so not, not by the, the main application processor, but it would still be good to apply a coexistence protocol up here in the Linux space uh, so the 2.4 uh, transmissions are not, are not overlapping. Sure. So, so this is actually uh, available. So I'll have uh, some of the information is at the end of the slide. I can, I'll, can also give the information later. Okay. What's next um, in this area, let's say, of, of devices that implement multi-protocols? So uh, and this, uh, there was a question earlier. So I'll probably see uh, in, in the edge node, uh, even more integration that was possible. So it's kind of the, the hanging, low hanging fruit right now with those 2.4 uh, standards that actually um, are, are pretty commonly used. So it's, it makes sense from a cost perspective to be implemented in a, in a single integration, a single chip with a single multi-mode radio. But I will probably see other um, uh, radio patterns being added to the edge node in a, in a single integrated system. So uh, the, the, the most probable will be Wi-Fi. 
uh, especially for the 2.4. Again, there's some commonality of, of reusing some of the, uh, the deep phi and, and radio configuration. Uh, but of course, some of the, the wide area uh, network, uh, low pan networks such as uh, uh, LoRa, Sigfox, uh, those are using sub gigahertz, but uh, you could you could design radios that actually uh, multi mode between 2.4 and, and sub gigahertz. So that's probably the next frontier in terms of this integration. Um, another next uh, next gen uh, development that we could see, and there's also already some some talk on that uh, with with some announcements from from the center. But you see a lot more of these devices being implemented in uh, beyond the smart home. So you'll see those in um, things like uh, office buildings, in professional installation scenarios. Uh, but an example there, for instance, would be um, um, using the, the the beacon aspect of the BLE. Uh, in order to do location awareness, uh, but then uh, exploiting some of the, um, uh, the, the mesh network and uh, the, uh, the other characteristics uh, that enable six low pan and, and co-app based networks to operate on, on the other side of the, of the protocol and the stacks. Uh, so even more flexibility on the radio side, uh, even more programmability, programmability and Definitely those, those two trends at the end, you'll see mesh networks uh, really everywhere. Because right now, it's, it's ZigBee and Thread that have that native, but a lot of uh, the, the latest Wi-Fi uh, router packs, access point packs, actually implement some sort of, of mesh protocols. If you go to, uh, to Eero or Google or, or Linksys and, and, and these guys, you can actually uh, right now buy these mesh router systems. They, they still have some, some uh, proprietary characteristics. It's similar for BLE. Uh, on Bluetooth, you'll see some implementation of, uh, of mesh networks that run over BLE, and probably see more standardization in both of those two areas on, on Wi-Fi and BLE. So a lot of, of mesh capability, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so it will exploit these multi-mode characteristics of these radios. And then, uh, depending on the, the various use cases, the various network one needs to connect to, the various devices, uh, the, uh, one needs to have direct connectivity, then you'll have um, the possibility to operate in one of the mesh configuration of the other. Definitely IPv6, there are a lot of, of um, uh, other discussion also here this week on, on IPv6 and uh, six low pan protocol and end-to-end -end principles. Uh, we'll see more and more of, of those. Uh, it's been going on for a while and I think we, we now see uh, enough critical mass in IPv6 from the infrastructure. So ISP based, so it, it kind of makes sense to, to actually use IPv6 up to the, to the edge node. Uh, so that would allow kind of simplifying the stack a little bit. So if you've got this projection of what can um, uh, be in a, uh, a, a bit more deployed in a, uh, in a few months or years, and it's possible to do now, but it's really not, not typical, it's kind of simplify the, the, the protocol stack that, that we saw earlier. Kind of have, okay, this multimode transceiver, all these uh, phi interfaces, which are blurred for the application, they're just interfaces. So similar how to how you use IP over Wi-Fi and Ethernet and cellular, you'd use IP over BLE or 15.4 or, or Wi-Fi for the IoT and a set of common uh, modules and common software stacks starting with UDP, DTLS, uh, with some uh, helper application layer. Again, I don't see, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, reduced fragmentation on that side, but one can hope. Uh, and then a device application. Definitely from a, from a stack and from a perspective, it would be a, a simplified, more, more seamless operation. Okay. Yeah. All this assumes that 2.4 is enough availability. How much is there? Well, um, yeah, so, so again, I think this is beyond necessarily the frequency band. So as we saw, it, it's, it's more common right now to, to see multimode radios operating in 2.4, but you can have multiple radios that do multiple, multiple frequency bands. For instance, if you go on Wi-Fi, multiple of the, the variants uh, uh, that, that what Wi-Fi provides in that area. Uh, so um, I don't think that necessarily this increases the usage of the, of the 2.4. In, in, with such systems, right? Because you'll, you'll still see in, in individual systems uh, enough usage, so it's, it's uh, perhaps a, a more coordinated use of it if you've got this, uh, this kind of systems. Okay. 
So next steps, and uh, I think uh, you will be able to, to access these uh, ongoing to uh, the, the links. Uh, again, uh, NXP provides some of these platforms uh, along with the, with the drivers and stacks. Uh, with a lot of the other uh, microcontroller and, and uh, connect microcontroller uh, vendors offer, offer similar um, uh, capabilities. So it's really go to your, your favorite platform vendor and, uh, and choose one of their platforms there both for the edge node and uh, the, the gateway side. Uh, it, it's uh, good if you're not already a member to, to maybe join the standard bodies because uh, then you'd, you'd be able to influence some of the specification directions. And uh, first and foremost, you'd be able to, to take part in the uh, certification program that those standard bodies offer that guarantee interoperability. If you want to actually get more details on the, the less common like Zigbee and Thread, uh, standards. There are a couple of events uh, that are open to, to everyone. So the first one for Zigbee is in March 6 in Austin and uh, for Thread got an event March 27 in, in Mountain View, uh, which are again open to the public and you can actually get a deep dive of, uh, of these standards more than uh, we'd be able to do here. And of course, uh, contribute to open source software around those, starting with Zephyr, which um, uh, adds a lot of the building blocks for building the multi-protocol multi systems and stacks uh, right now, but also Minute, uh, Nimble, uh, IoTivity, or, or OpenThread. So those are the, some of the, uh, let's say, high, higher profile open source software that, that are relevant for, for building such systems. Uh, most of them are, are work in progress, so not all the blocks are, are, are there and available. Uh, so definitely would, uh, would use some help. So uh, at the end, also wanted to have a quick uh, overview and a quick example in practice. So uh, for that, uh, actually, we'll, we'll go back to that uh, system that we saw. So we've got this mesh network. Uh, I'll use thread for that. And then we've got this multi-protocol node that also has um, uh, a BLE radio on. So for that, I'm, I'm going to use the uh, NXP Freedom KW41Z, which is our, uh, our latest generation launch in October, uh, multi-mode device that implements uh, these, uh, these standards. Uh, so I've got a, a couple of, of boards here. So I'll go then uh, just to, to see what's going on. I like, uh, also have uh, one of the other variants of the KW41, which is um, um, operating as a protocol sniffer. So I'll plug that in. Actually plug two of these in. Because again, it's, it's a multi-protocol. OK, and then let me go to the Yeah, I plugged in two, and you'll see why. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I've got this uh, this adapter um, that actually allows me to use these two uh, two units as uh, virtual interfaces that are uh, Wireshark compatible. So uh, with this uh, small add-on, I'll just launch Wireshark. Uh, and going back to, to this, uh, I can see here in Ethernet 7 is, is the, the virtual interface. So going to Wireshark, I'll choose this virtual interface. I'll start monitoring on it. And I've, I see here the two devices that I plugged in. So what I'll do is actually, uh, I, I have the 15.4 channels at the top. So I'll start the first one on, uh, on channel 25. So, and then I'll, I'll uh, power up one of these nodes, which is a thread node. So I can uh, then see the, uh, the MLE uh, messages that thread uses in order to synchronize the mesh network. Okay, so this is now operational on thread. Then going to the, to the second one. Okay, so these will now uh, do a, a, a link synchronization between them. 
So you can see here that there, there has been some, uh, some link requests, parent requests, parent response. So these two devices are now talking to each other from a, a thread perspective. I'll also uh, create a small network. It's four devices. We, we usually deploy um, uh, significantly more in testing, like tens or uh, I think the, the largest network with it is about two, 250 devices. Uh, we got just four here in the thread uh, mesh. Okay. I can see in the Wireshark how the the, uh, the devices uh, change the uh, thread uh, management messages between them. And one thing that I can do, actually, I'm, I can use the the board um, button interface uh, to actually. Um, okay. Uh, to actually send messages uh, that are application layer messages. So you can actually see some of the co-op messages that are, being, uh, that are being exchanged. So you can see the con uh, messages here. Okay. But what I can actually do, because those devices, all these devices are actually have the BLE radio, have my, my smart device. So I'll, um, I'll launch an app. So it's a Kinetis BLE toolbox that we use for our uh, BLE reference design. And here in the app, I have a, a thread shell interface. So if I, I tap that, I actually see the, the beacon advertisements of, the, of these nodes that operate on thread, but they're also sending uh, BLE advertisements uh, uh, telling me that I can actually connect to these devices along with, with their um, uh, RSSI. So if I tap one of them in the app, I can actually go un and connect through a shell interface. So it's now connecting over BLE. Okay, and then I've got a, a, a set of shortcuts here, probably not very visible, but I also sh uh, can show on the slide. So I, I, I just did an if config. So with an if config in the shell, I can actually see the IPv6 addresses that the, uh, the device configures on the thread side. So if I go back to the slides, uh, this is kind of how it looks like. So I've got uh, the set of IPv6 addresses on the thread side, and I can, and I can actually go in the application there and also send uh, co-op messages for, uh, for, my, for my application over the, or the, over the thread mesh. Yeah? I've been sending uh, one byte to the NXP TR5 over and over again, but I don't see anything happening. Uh, on, on BLE? Yeah, after connecting. Oh, you connected it? Um, probably need to implement the specific profile. I'm not sure if you're you're using you're using the same app or. I'm using NRF. Oh, okay, then it's probably not the the same profile on the wireless UART because it's kind of a UART transport over JDD, so it's probably that's why it's it's not reacting. Uh, so this is I guess still a bit to to standardize in in one of these standard bodies. How do you actually do the um, the the transport over BLE things like you. If you want to do IP, IP over BLE or, or a common generic raw, raw transport. Okay, so this, this shows uh, basically the, the use case uh, picture here. You've got a, a BLE connection. Maybe it's not always that you need to, to do that. Maybe it's on, you only need that to, to um, show a certain UI temporarily. And at uh, the, um, the same time, the device is also operational on the, on the thread network. And actually, going back here, so then the, the reason I had two devices is that I can use another one for, um, for BLE. Uh, and definitely with a single radio for BLE, it's, it's, uh, you don't get all the information, for instance, in the connection. But going to, to Wireshark, I, I, I've started seeing also the, the BLE advertisements. So uh, it's on the same interface with Thread, so I can actually, if I've got a, a debug system that's plugged into Wireshark or TCP dump or something that's using PCAP, I can actually uh, be able to, to, uh, to verify and test uh, both protocols simultaneously. And uh, it's useful to do things like uh, see how the, the two protocols coordinate with each other. 
So I've got a lot of, of advertisements here, but if I, if I filter, let's say, UDP, I'll also see the, the thread-only messages that are also showing up. Okay. And uh, finally, okay, sorry. We're, we're close to the end of the time, but I think we're the last session in, in this room, so maybe have a couple of minutes. The, uh, another example I wanted to show you, it's using um, another two boards. So I'll just turn off these. Uh, these ones that I use and plug, plug in others. So I'll plug it in this actually to my to my PC. And the reason for that is to show the uh, host SDK. So this is a, if you do things like a gateway, a mod protocol gateway, um, uh, then the host SDK comes that is a set of tools and, and uh, BSD license software that runs on things like uh, Linux, Windows, uh, most support Mac systems. And you can actually build a set of library and interface with the devices at the, through a serial interface, being able to control and coordinate on uh, two or more of these protocols. Um, so with that, uh, for instance, I can, uh, let, me, let me see for instance, Okay, I go to the, to the device manager and the two devices that I plugged in were um, the J-Link uh, COM port on six and 15. Okay, so I can then go to a shell interface uh, here and just use one of the, the multi-mode Python scripts that, uh, that I, I wrote, so 15 and then say the thread channel is 24. Okay. So now I can actually, for testing purposes, also for, uh, for uh, better um, use of, of, uh, of development, while I go and develop and integrate such protocols, uh, I can actually use this set of, of host-based tools to start my thread networks. You'll see a lot of log events as the, as the thread network and the, um, for instance, right now it's running uh, the mesh commissioning protocol to authenticate these two devices to each other. So it's a lot of, of scripting that I can do with, uh, with, this, with these host APIs. Okay. So the thread initialization uh, completed. So with these two nodes, I, I now have a, a, a small thread network created. But then, and you can already start to see here, uh, a lot of GADT messages. So I, I started also using the serial interface to, uh, to connect to the, and control the, the, the BLE interface. So right now these two devices started sending some ping. So you see the, the ping at the, the thread level. But if I go back to my, um, to my BLE app, uh, just to, to, to differentiate uh, around the heart rate, I also see one of those devices implementing a heart rate profile application so I can connect to it. And actually I'm starting getting the, the heart rate information even those two devices are also sending uh, ping, pings to each other on, uh, on the thread network. Uh, so pretty useful for testing and, and scripting and, and batching various commands. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, thanks very much for your time, and uh, let me know if there are other questions at the end. Are the tools that you're using scriptable or open source? Uh, they're not open source. Uh, for this device, we, we do provide them in, in source with a BSD license, but they're not part of an open source uh, project. Uh, again, a lot of the open source, the true open source, uh, in, in projects like Zephyr or, or others are, are still work in progress and being now ramped up and definitely uh, everybody's help is, is appreciated on that. Yep. So if that's not running Zephyr, what's producing the cool app packets? It's, it's, um, 
uh, co-op module that runs, in this case, the, uh, this device is actually using FreeRTOS. So it's actually a co-op module that runs over FreeRTOS. Uh, so, no, going to the, so what, what's currently available for this platform in terms of enablement, uh, so if you, if you um, see these two links here, so um, from a driver perspective, but also from a stack perspective, uh, for the firmware of these devices, uh, there are a set of, of um, firmware modules that you can actually deploy through um, uh, uh, Eclipse GCC, ARM GCC, or IAR. Uh, based uh, that NXP provides. It's, for instance, similar to on BLE, I've got a um, uh, soft device stack or, or something similar. You'll get all, all, the, all the enablement uh, for these devices as you, as you get the boards. You just need to, to go and download them from, from those links. So you get everything to, to build these solutions, but again, a lot of these is not yet fully uh, implemented in, in open source projects. And now it's still early, and a lot of the, the code in this SDK packages are, um, uh, it's not binary blob, so it's uh, both the radio drivers as well as the, uh, the coexistence framework that I showed, as well as the, uh, the uh, um, upper layers of the stacks uh, are, are provided in source, so that can, uh, can be modified and uh, used as a model. Okay, yes. Static routing, uh, yeah, well, um, it, it's a bit difficult to do that with one of the standards uh, because the standards that already do mesh kind of have their own specification around how you do that. Uh, so that's usually dynamic, uh, especially for these IoT devices. It's different from, uh, in Zigbee, it's different versus how you do it in Thread, for instance. Uh, but it's usually handled by the, by the stack based on the specification. So um, fr from a static route perspective, device to device, it's, it's more difficult. But if you consider things like border hours or devices at the edge where you've got, for instance, IPv6 provisioning from, the, uh, from your ISP, you can definitely do more on, on such devices and kind of configure uh, which, which packets, based on the source prefix on IPv6, which packets get routed across the border and which, uh, which go from the, uh, from the uh, upper layer infrastructure to the IoT network. Okay, so I think we're uh, at the end of the time, so thanks again, everyone, and um, have the some of the the next steps links here if you want to look at the slide later. Thanks. <laughs>